Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. This week, one of the most exciting and impressive finales you will ever see at the UCI Women's World Championships and one of the most impressive but unexciting in the men's. I'll be looking back at how Annemiek van Vleuten won a world title against all the odds and how Remco Evenepoel cemented himself amongst the greatest there have ever been. I'll also be bringing you up to speed on the controversy currently surrounding Mathieu van der Poel. I will start though with the Men's World Championships. The biggest climb of the day, Mount Kira, came early. Too early? Well, this is what we'd said in our World Championships preview. 8.7 k's at 5% average gradient, uh, so it rises about 450 meters in altitude. So not insignificant, but normally you would say coming so early in the races, it would be unlikely to have a large impact on them. However, this is 2022, and riders seem unafraid to go hard early, just as we saw last year in 2021, in fact, in Belgium for the championships. Now, for the teams who want to make this race really hard, you've got to say that's the perfect opportunity to make it so. And so it went. This is 2022, and so that climb, with 230 kilometres to go, saw the bunch blown to smithereens behind the day's early breakaway. That was down to the French team, who under the management of Thomas Vauclair, have seen aggressive racing result in two gold medals for Alaphilippe over the last two years. However, the problem for them this time was that whilst they'd split the race, their big leaders were not in that front split, but Pogacar and Van Aert were. Probably for that reason, the cohesion wasn't really there, and most of them were eventually brought back by the main peloton, which was being controlled by Germany. Uh, two riders from Australia, Plapp and O'Connor, plus Battistella of Italy, Seri of Belgium and Sivakov of France, eventually made their way across to the early break and enjoyed a lead of over seven minutes with 150 kilometers to go. That was then gradually brought down until with 75 k's to go, the French were at it again. Pasteur lighting things up on Mount Pleasant, pulling a large group clear. Now the trouble for them was that amongst the group they pulled clear were three Belgians, De Wolf, Hermans and Rimko Avenepoel. Now this, I think, is where the French made a bit of a mistake. They were more than happy to drive the group on and pull it clear of the other main favourites behind. Without Avenepoel there, that might have been a tactic worth trying, but with him? I mean, surely there was only going to be one outcome at that point. Avenepoel made a first acceleration with just under 60 kilometres of the race remaining, and once that was reeled in, his decisive attack then came with 35 k's to go, with the main peloton already trailing by two minutes. Only a grimacing Alexei Luxenko of Kazakhstan was able to follow, but 10 k's later, he was done, and Avenepoel was on his way to an historic rainbow jersey. He barely looked back, and he really didn't need to. We've seen it time and time again. Once Avenepoel goes, you're very unlikely to see him again until after the finish line, and that was the case again yesterday. So, not the most exciting or tantalizing end to a World Championships we've ever seen, and I think that's mainly down to just how good Remco Avenepoel is as a bike rider. The only other rider in the history of this sport to have won both the junior and elite men's road race championships is Greg LeMond, who completed that double in 1989. Avenepoel is the first rider since Bernardino in 1980 to win a monument, a grand tour and the world championships in the same season. He's 130 days younger than Eddie Merckx was when he completed the triple, but not even Merckx had done it in the same season by that point. It wasn't until 1971 when Merckx was 26 that he won a Grand Tour, the World Champs and a Monument in the same year. Although to be fair to Merckx, he did win three monuments in that single season. Avenepoel is also only the sixth male rider in history to win a medal at both the Elite Time Trial and Road Race in a single season. And his winning margin in the Road Race on Sunday was the biggest since 1968. Uh, back then, Vittorio Adorni took the rainbow jersey with an advantage of almost 10 minutes over the second place rider. So, there may not have been much suspense, much excitement, or much intrigue in the finale of the men's road race yesterday, but nevertheless, what Avenepoel achieved there is nothing short of incredible. Some way behind Avenepoel, what remained of the group he'd attacked from was going for the silver and bronze medals until they dilly-dallied about enough to allow the group behind to catch them. So, getting the silver on the day was Christophe Laporte for France, whilst the bronze went to local favourite Michael Matthews. In the women's, the odds of a Dutch win had gone from very favourable to the odds almost being stacked against them in the lead up to the race. Uh, Demi Vollering was unable to start the race due to Covid, whilst Annemiek van Fleurten fractured her elbow in a fall that came at the start of the mixed relay time trial. She did start the road race, in pain, and presumably under par. 
Uh, the team was still strong, but it looked like it would be Mariana Voss who would have all of the pressure on her shoulders. Now, the main animator in the finale of the race was Liana Lippert of Germany, who was incredibly strong on the climbs of Mount Pleasant. Twice she went, and twice she took a very strong group clear. Elisa longo Borghini, Ashley Norman Pascio, Cassia Nubiodoma, and Cecily Utrup Ludwig were the only riders able to follow her the last time up that climb. And for a good while, it looked like the Dutch would go home without a medal. Behind that group, Van Flirten seemed to be working for Voss on the climb, who in turn was unable to follow. So it left us with a five-woman group at the front and then a smaller group behind being driven by the Swiss and French teams, with Van Flirten sat on the back of that one, probably thinking that all chances of winning the rainbow jersey had gone out of the window. But then this is Van Flirten we are talking about, so she definitely wasn't thinking like that, particularly as the front group of five were brought back inside the last kilometre. And this is where Van Flirten and our commentator Marty McDonald came into their own. Here's how that unfolded. Inside one kilometer to go now. Anyone going to make the move? Will Annemiek van Vleuten now take a flyer from the back of the group? One big effort to try and take the world title against the odds. Yes, she is right from the back of the group. Van Vleuten goes now. Is she going to take this one? Look at the power of Annemiek van Vleuten. Is this the moment when she takes this title again? What an absolute legend. Annemiek van Vleuten with a frack elbow she went down in the mixed relay she has fought against the odds Annemiek van Vleuten is gonna take this world title what an absolute ride from the Dutch rider how on earth has she achieved that that is something special what a finish to that race I mean I think everyone's reaction was exactly the same WTF just happened the answer Van Flirten just became world champion for the second time, and so she will wear the rainbow jersey for her last season as a pro rider in 2023. A hugely disappointed Lotta Capecchi of Belgium won the sprint for second, with Sylvia Persico of Italy in third. In the first ever women's U23 event, which was run off with the elite world championships, Neve Fisher-Black of New Zealand took the win, finishing at the back of that front group, 12 seconds in front of the group that contained second place Pfeiffer Georgie of Great Britain. Now, unfortunately for all of the world champions crowned last week, they have a little less time than normal to enjoy it because next year's all-encompassing world championships in Glasgow, where almost every cycling discipline will be fought for, is in early August, just 10 and a half months from now. In the other events last week, Zoe Bagstedt doubled up in the junior women's time trial and road race. In the former, she was over six seconds per kilometre faster than the second place rider and had a faster average speed than the pro women to the first time check on restricted gears, whilst in the latter, she attacked early and won by a whopping two minutes. That means that she is the current world champion on the road, time trial, cyclocross and the Madison event on the track simultaneously, something that we don't think has ever been done before by any rider in any category. And she completed that collection on the day of her 18th birthday. The future is bright for Zoe Bagstedt to say the very least. Congratulations to her. In the junior men's, Emil Herzog of Germany outsprinted a very disappointed Antonio Morgado of Portugal. Both riders are joining Hagen's Berman Action next year, the team that's been the pathway to the pro ranks for so many riders over the years. In the junior men's time trial, Joshua Tarling, who started as the pre-race favourite, was the only rider who was able to go quicker than Australian Hamish McKenzie, who'd been sat in the hot seat for much of the day. Uh, Tarling will now join Ineos Grenadiers at the start of next year on a three-year deal. And finally, the controversial U23 men's race. Why is it controversial? Because both pros and amateurs are able to compete at the event, something which many people, myself included, think should not be allowed. Now, I know that many of you will disagree with that. The rules are in place that allow for it, so it's the rider's choice if they're of the right age. However, the winner of the race can't say they were the best U23 rider in the world on that day because so many are competing at the elite category, including eventual winner Remco Evenepoel. Now, my opinion is that it should be under 23 riders who do not yet have a full pro contract because the race for me, it's about showcasing the talent that hasn't quite made it to the pro ranks just yet. 
Uh, regardless, we ended up with two big name riders up the road who are already racing at World Tour level. Yevgeny Fedorov of Kazakhstan, who finished the Welter a couple of weeks back, and Matthias Vacek of the Czech Republic, who won a stage of the UAE Tour at the start of this season in February. In the sprint, Vacek was no match for Fedorov, which was a bit of a surprise because Vacek is normally quite quick to the line. But it was the Kazakh who took the title exactly 10 years after his compatriot Lukchenko. Interestingly, Fedorov had chosen to compete in the elite category at the time trial a few days before, in which he finished 28th. Not Fedorov's fault at all, but I personally think the rules need changing. But if you disagree, you can let me know in the comment section just down below. So, at the end of the week of racing in Wollongong in Australia, this is how the medal table looked. Great Britain at the top with three golds, a silver and a bronze, all in age category events, with the Netherlands in second place and Norway third. Uh, just before I move on to a couple of the incidents that happened at the World Championships, I would love to know what your thoughts were on the week's racing. The course, the crowds, the racing, etc. Let me know again in the comment section just down below. Right, let's move on to much of Thunderpool now. Uh, the Dutchman went to Wollongong as one of the big favourites to go home with the gold medal, but any chances of that happening were scuppered on Saturday night. Now, the story unfolded yesterday during the race, in which Van der Poel climbed off after 30 kilometres, and this is what we know so far. So the Dutch team was staying in a Novotel near Sydney, almost an hour from Wollongong. Van der Poel's roommate had got a cold, so instead of sharing a room with him, he shared a room with his girlfriend on a different floor of the hotel to the rest of the team. As he was trying to get to sleep, some teenage girls continuously knocked on his door. An altercation ensued, with Van der Poel accused of pushing them both. He was then arrested and charged with assault and only returned from the police station at 4 a.m. Now, the police statement from that night reads as follows. He was allegedly involved in a verbal altercation with two teenage girls aged 13 and 14. It's further alleged that the man then pushed both teenagers, with one falling to the ground and the other being pushed into a wall, causing a minor graze to her elbow. Hotel management were notified of the incident, who then called the police. So without much sleep and in completely the wrong frame of mind, it's not surprising that he didn't get too far in the race, but perhaps more surprising that he even started it or was allowed to. Uh, Rumours then circulated that he might have to stay in Australia until the 23rd of October, but this morning the news broke on NOS in the Netherlands that he'd had his passport returned and was on his flight home, having paid a total of 1,500 euros in fines. He's also apparently banned from entering Australia for the next three years. Uh, his lawyers, though, are going to appeal, and I'm quite sure this is not the last that we will hear of that story. The other big controversy away from the racing came a day or two earlier, when it emerged that respected investigative journalist Ian Treller of Cycling Tips was denied accreditation at the race. The UCR responded to say that within their rules, only a maximum of three people from any one written publication can be accredited, and that Cycling Tips already had three people there in Australia. Lots of other journalists then came to Treller's defence, saying there have been plenty of examples of publications receiving more than three accreditations at the UCI World Champs. Now, the reason that this was so controversial is because Treller has written a couple of articles with which many of you will be familiar, which have criticised the UCI, and in particular, their relationship with certain countries and individuals, from Turkmenistan to Russia to Afghanistan. And Cycling Tips felt that it was for this reason that Treller was denied accreditation. And when you look back to an interview that the UCI president, David Lepartion, gave to Velo News back in April, you can see why they think it might be personal. In that interview, La Passion first claimed not to really read cycling tips, while simultaneously revealing that he knows quite a lot about what is written on cycling tips. Uh, he claimed that Trello wakes up in the morning with the sole aim of taking the UCI down. Now, if the UCI did deliberately block his accreditation, you wonder what kind of favourable outcome they were hoping for. Had they granted it to him, I think it's very unlikely that anything he'd written would have resulted in anywhere near the negative publicity they received by denying it. It was another bizarre situation that left many people disappointed. Right, what have we got coming up for you lovely people on GCN Plus this week? A stage race, a one-day race, and a load of cyclocross is the answer. The Crow race starts tomorrow and continues through to Sunday. Now, last week, I said that that was where Jonas Vignigal would resume competition this year for the first time since winning the Tour de France. His name was then removed from the provisional start list. And from what I've just been reading just a few minutes ago, it looks like he might be back on. Who knows is the answer, but regardless, there are some other big names taking part, and you can watch that race if you're in the US, Europe, or the Asia Pacific, excluding China, Japan, and New Zealand. 
On Wednesday, the Italian one-day classics continue with the Coppa Agostoni, available in Europe, the Asia-Pacific, excluding China, Japan and New Zealand, plus Latin America, excluding Mexico. Uh, there's a whole load more cyclocross for you at the weekend as well, with the exact cross from Mullerbeck on Sunday, and rounds five and six of the USCX in Baltimore on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, that's also when you'll be able to watch the latest round of the Triathlon Super League from Toulouse. Beyond the racing, we've got a cracking documentary being released for you tomorrow. Uh, Bordeaux Paris was the best bike race you've never heard of. A midnight start, 550 kilometers long, and ridden behind motorized dernies with winners including Jacques Anquetil and Tom Simpson. Uh, anyway, more than 30 years since Bordeaux Paris was last raced, pro cyclists Mitch Docker and Sam Bewley set out to recreate the infamous 1965 edition. Here's a quick trailer for you. Bordeaux Paris, c'est encore de nos jours la course cycliste qui frappe l'imagination. 570 km, 15 heures sur un vélo, ce n'est pas commun. What distance have you actually ridden? 300 k's along the front of the river. Yeah, San Remo, me yeah. too. Can you actually imagine turning around in San Remo and then riding back to Milan? No, but we're going to give it a crack. <laughs> Mate, back in the day, the 60s, the 70s, those guys weren't just riding hard and fast. They looked awesome on the bike. I would have preferred it back then. The racing or just being a rock star? I just been a rock star, but yeah. <laughs> yeah! I'm a better sprinter than Mitch. I always have been. <laughs> Mais à Châtellerault et aujourd'hui à Poitiers, la compétition revêt un nouveau visa. Des motos commerciales entraînent les coureurs dans leur sillage jusqu'à Paris. Next thing I knew, I was just smashing along and things went off at a mile a minute. I've averaged nearly the same watts as I've averaged for Flanders. C'est l'intensité totale dans cette action où les hommes se relèvent, sont groggy, repartent, refrappent et sont à nouveau agenouillés par les attaques des autres. I'm really, really looking forward to watching that one in full. Uh, moving on now, and I'll give you a brief summary of the cyclocross action from the weekend. Over in the US, Europeans once again dominated. Uh, there seems to be no stopping Vincent Bastains in the USCX, who took victories on both days, beating Curtis White by 17 seconds on both occasions, whilst USCX debutant Anne-Marie Vorst won both women's events on Saturday and Sunday. On Saturday, she came to the line 23 seconds clear of Frenchwoman Caroline Mani, whilst on Sunday, it was Madigan Munro who finished runner-up. Uh, Worst has clearly decided to get over to the US early to acclimatise ahead of the first round of the UCI World Cup, which is in Waterloo on the 9th of October. Uh, many riders, though, have chosen to stay in Europe a little longer, and many of those uh, competed at the exact cross in Beringen yesterday. Fem van Empel backed up her win in round one, although she was pushed closer this time by former world champion Lucinda Brandt. What a start, though, it's been for van Empel. Uh, in the men's, Eli Isabit took a comfortable victory ahead of his teammate Michael Van Turenhout with Lars van der Haar in third. In other news, the UCI last week announced the venues for the 2026 and 27 World Championships. Uh, Montreal, Canada will play host to the champs in 2026, whilst the big, all-encompassing World Champs will take place for the second time in 2027 in the Haute-Savoie region in France. That, you would imagine, will be a very hilly one. Uh, now, the rumours that Adam Yates is headed for UAE Team Emirates from Ineos was confirmed last week, and that's quite the GC team that they're building over there. Pogaccia, Almeida, Ayuso, McNulty, Soler, and now Yates. It's going to be interesting to see what their respective race programmes look like next year, but they're going to be a force to be reckoned with. Ineos Grenadiers, meanwhile, have continued to invest in young talent. Uh, they've just signed the Canadian Michael Leonard straight from the junior category. Not a rider, I have to say, that I know too much about. But I reckon that they're going to be one of the youngest teams out there in the World Tour in 2023. 
And finally, the Kiwi Georgia Williams will join EF Education Tibco from Bike Exchange, whilst Ethiopian Wale Hagos Bere, who currently rides for EF's development team, will head in the other direction. He signed for Team Bike Exchange until the end of 2025. That is all for this week's GCN Racing News Show. I'm off to get myself back into the European time zone, but I'll see you again this time next week. Bye for now.